Hi, I'm Greg Magruder, curator for Global Events, speaking to you from Grosvenor Auditorium at National Geographic's headquarters in downtown Washington, D.C. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's screening and discussion, Last Wild Places, Rewilding the Americas. We are so pleased that tonight's program is presented in partnership with the DC Environmental Film Festival as part of American University's annual program, Films Across Borders. This year's theme for that program is hope and resilience. We also thank our donors and supporters who make it possible for National Geographic to invest in and elevate the work of ex explorers around the world. To learn more about making a donation or supporting our programs, I invite you to visit nationalgeographic.org. The films we're going to see tell the story of two magnificent places in Montana and Argentina that a team of dedicated individuals have brought back from the brink. These films were created by National Geographic's Impact Media Team, which produces yearly more than 200 pieces of media that include virtual reality experiences, educational video, along with short and long form documentaries. The leader of this team is executive producer Vanessa Sorreo, who will be introducing our programs tonight. Please join me in welcoming my colleague, Vanessa. Thanks, Greg. I'm really happy to be here tonight. Our first film this evening is about an ambitious conservation effort taking place right here in the United States. It tells the story of the American Prairie Reserve's work to create a fully intact prairie ecosystem and what this means for local tribal communities. We felt this was an important story to tell because we wanted to show that conservation isn't something that happens somewhere else, but that it can happen close to home as well. Everything that is in this creation is put here for a specific purpose. All the things that fly, all of the things that swim, all of the things that crawl, they all have a special place in our culture. It is our responsibility as the two-leggeds to try to foster good relationships with the Earth. And it's beginning now. I've taught for 17 years here at the high school and also in the grade school. And I teach community language classes and uh, I'm a firm believer in our Indian way of life. We've been working diligently to try to revitalize our language and reintroduce it to our children. Hey Des, how goes it my man? Good. New info here, son. My ancestors were the Nakota people of the prairie. From the Great Rockies to the Great Lakes, we consider this area in between to be the land that was meant for our people. Where you been all my life, Des? Just now wake up? Yeah. Oh. We thrived in the country that we lived in. So remember that uh, all of these things so far in the story they're all in reference to heaven, how, how it is in heaven, where the June berries are heavy and the buffalo are fat and the grass is tall and the creek's running and the teepees are white and everything's good. People look young, look like you guys. This is all in reference to Indian heaven. The buffalo, he was the image, a symbol of God to our people because everything we knew come from the buffalo. When the Western people came, they took away the buffalo from our people. They brought in the cattle, they brought in the farming, the mining, the fishing, the logging, all of these kind of things. Mm -hmm. 
As far as the American Prairie Reserve goes, in my mind, what they're attempting to do is one of the more impressive things that's happened in this country. I grew up in Great Falls, Montana. My parents used to bring me out, and we would camp right out on the prairie. And seeing this landscape was very exciting and wide open with possibilities. It's not hard to put together in your imagination what could be here again. The idea and mission at American Prairie Reserve is to create the largest wildlife reserve so far ever created in the lower 48 states. Open it up to the public, save it for future generations. We're creating the reserve out of existing intact native prairie. There's very little of this left around the world where you could reassemble something like we're talking about here. The best thing about this is we don't have to buy it all. Much of the land that we are pulling together to be a part of this model already belongs to the public. What we're doing is gluing these parcels together with pieces of private land, taking down the fences, bringing all the wildlife back. So we have intact prairie that looks like it has for thousands of years. People are excited about the heritage of wildlife that they have read about, and they want to be a part of saving that as a part of American history. But some people in the local area think that this may not be the best use of land out here. That perhaps this land should only be used for food production. So we wanted to start something that benefits local people in the work that they're choosing to do. Ranching has been in my family probably about 100 years. I'm the fifth generation rancher here. You always hear the term that stuff gets in your DNA, I guess, and that's probably what it is. It's just in my, it's in my blood. My dad, he bought this when he was a young man in his 20s. We've scattered his ashes here. I'll probably get scattered here too, I suppose. I had essentially grew up about an hour north of here and moved back here and doing our thing. I told her, move back here and live a nice, quiet, leisure country life. She told me, I get bored easy, so I'm trying not to let her get bored. I'm not bored. <laughs> we joke sometimes when we're having coffee on our front porch that people pay to go on vacation to live the lifestyle we live. And, you know, there are days that it's hard, but there are more days that it's really nice. I think there's constantly threats facing ranchers. They're afraid of getting diseases from the buffalo. They're afraid of predators or land grab. It just seems like every time you turn around, the deck is stacked against you. So when I heard about American Prairie Reserve, my first opinion were very negative. I was very much, very much against them. It's like, go away, leave us alone. That's not how we live here. But as I started educating myself, I got involved with Wild Sky Ranching which is the, a branch of the APR, saw it as an opportunity to make a few bucks to utilize these conservation practices, whether it be wildlife-friendly fencing or camera traps. Wild Sky sets up cameras, and then you, know, you get a picture of a mountain lion or a bear, you get a couple hundred bucks, and uh, that adds up over the course of the year. That helps buy hay or part of a vet bill, but definitely helps my bottom line. And, so far, the camera traps have caught bears, mountain lions, and to my knowledge, I have not lost a single calf. Man, these coyotes are gonna make me rich. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we are living in harmony, living in balance, and wildlife is, is thriving and they're doing well. I'm gonna have to go get more clothes on. The wind's got a bite to it. To leave this land as a legacy is, is extremely important. 
Ranching is evolving and it has to evolve. And I think if we're not very mindful of the connection that our society has to have with nature, it'll be too late. It's funny how much green is still out there, huh? I know. That's the other reason we're having problems catching the bison. To me, bison are really interesting in that they fit so well in this place. This guy got mud on the truck. <laughs> They're being brought back simply to fulfill their ecological role, their ecological niche in that landscape. Uh, what we're gonna do today is we are gonna sort the cows from the bulls. Number one priority is for everyone to leave here safe. We are relocating bison to Fort Belknap. Fort Belknap is a great receiving site because of the social and cultural values the Native American tribes have for bison. So, kind of how it's going to work. Essentially, we're sorting out four cows out of here, and we want to get them separated from the bulls. Um, so we will be running some animals into this pen. When bison need to be relocated to another property or conservation organization or tribe, it starts with capturing the bison off of large pastures and then sorting them into different pens depending on their destination, age, and sex. Close again, close again, close Bars, I, I dropped my rope. I'm gonna have to tie that thing in your hand. <laughs> All right. Once they're sorted, they will be shipped and loaded onto a truck and hauled to their destination where they will be released and able to be bison again. There's some things that there's just really no words for at times. To see them back here, you know, places where their, their ancestors roamed long ago, you know, and to see them in place is pretty, pretty cool. There are more and more buffalo that are coming back to the places that they belong. It does my heart good, it does my mind good because as the buffalo grow stronger, my people grow stronger. We're living in this time to see a lot of those things come to pass where our people are going to find themselves and become a vibrant, thriving people again. I think a person is foolish to think that they could ever own the land. And those are things that our people have said from the beginning of time. There's an old song among our people that says, my relatives don't be foolish. Death is a hard thing, but the earth is the only thing that lives forever.
That was a wonderful film that we just saw. And we are fortunate that we have two people from the American Prayer Reserve. We've got with us today Allison Fox, who's led the organization since February 2018. And she's had various leadership roles at the organization since 2007. We also are fortunate to have with us someone you saw in the film at the opening of the film, Kenneth Tuffy Helgeson. And Tuffy is the vice chairman of Island Mountain Development Group and is a member of the Nakoda tribe. So welcome to you two and to Vanessa, who is the filmmaker. I think to, to some people it was surprising to learn that uh, the prairies are one of our most endangered ecosystems. And, you know, Allison and Tuffy, you know, what makes this ecosystem so special and why is it important that we preserve prairie ecosystems. I'm happy to take that one, Greg. Um, the prairie is so much more diverse and complex than first meets the eye. It has incredible biodiversity. More than 300 bird species, nearly 100 mammals, a thousand species of plants. This really truly was once America's Serengeti. Um, and in addition to that biodiversity, the, the prairies um, store carbon, they contribute to clean air and water, and yet they are our least protected terrestrial biome. And really the greatest threat to the prairie is the plow. Millions of acres of prairie in the Great Plains are, are tilled up every year and the grasses and their root systems are the foundation of the ecosystem. So once you lose that, it is very difficult and expensive to re restore. So really the time is now to protect prairies. They're important for the biodiversity they contain. They're important for life on this planet. So one thing that we saw in the film was that it is just as important that we involve people living in that area. Uh, Telfi, can you talk about why is that so crucial to the development of the entire ecosystem of the prairie? Uh, I guess I would start out with, you know, kind of doing a little going backwards in history a little bit in how things came across this continent in regards to um, westward expansion and uh, the need for commerce, the need for, you know, a new country, all these types of things where our people were kind of misplaced. Well, at the same time, when our people were being misplaced, the animals and, and just uh, everything that happened in, in this country, like we were talking about the plow, those things all became misplaced too. And uh, we've adapted to the plow. We were taught by the United States government that we needed to learn how to become productive people in this new world, as if we're not productive to start out with. But uh, so we've, we've come accustomed to plows, we've come accustomed to cattle ranching, all these types of things. So at this point, you know, as APR came in and they started to make their presence known, there was a lot of um, resistance, I guess, toward all of that. But as we're building these relationships and we're, we're understanding what's going on, not only here, but the, the neighboring communities around us, you know, we, we've come a long ways in that healing process. Thank you. So, so you talked about the resistance and I thought one thing that was important in this film was uh, telling that story. So, and this question is for you, Vanessa. So how were you able to capture that? Well, that's a, that's a great question. I think there were a lot of ways we could have told this story and um, where we, we wanted to start with the local community and with being sure we're, we were inclusive of the many voices that are living here um, in the prairie ecosystem and how they were working with American Prairie Reserve. Okay. But ultimately we wanted to tell a story of, of hope and give some, um, an optimistic look at how this type of project could succeed 
by working with the local people. Okay. So thank you so much for those remarks. I think you did a wonderful job of talking about the interconnectedness of every aspect of the park. So thank you all for sharing your story. And we will see all of you later. This next film to me really represents the sense of optimism we wanted to convey in this series. After years of hunting and habitat destruction, many wildlife species went extinct in the region that is now Ibarra National Park. Our film team was able to document the incredibly successful reintroduction efforts that are happening there now to show how this park has transformed into a vibrant place for both wildlife and people. Iberá was a place that was degraded by humans, and it's a place that is being recovered by humans. It's an incredible example of what we can achieve if we have the decision of restoring an ecosystem in a large scale. My job is related mostly to bring back the species that went extinct in these different national parks in which we are working. The biggest project is based here in Iberá. A big project sometimes is so complicated that you cannot do it by yourself. In Rewilding Argentina, we develop a team that is an incredible group of people. They are passionate for their work. The very first species that we reintroduced here in Everá was the giant anteater. Every animal that we release has a transmitter. That way we can follow the animal after it's been released. So the guys that monitor them can look at them several times a week and see how they are adapting to the new environment. Merci. 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 Vení. Merci. Bueno, está súper dormida, sí. pero está perfecta, ¿no? Está, sí, no. Sí. Es. Bueno, no, la dejamos acá tranquila y sí. listo. Ya lo que queríamos ver lo vimos. Sí, que estamos bueno, entonces. Un espectáculo, Pablo. Muy bien. Dale, vamos. Listo, vamos. They are doing incredibly well by their own. So the anteater is a story of, of success, really. We are in the northeastern part of Argentina, in a province called Corrientes, in the Ibera National Park. It's one of the biggest wetlands of South America. It's a very productive ecosystem. It's full of mammals and birds and reptiles, and also a lot of species that went extinct in the last century. There were a lot of hunters inside the marsh. They started to hunt birds to get the feathers, and they then turned to other species like caimans, capybaras, jaguars to get their skins. Our vision is to try to help reverse the biodiversity extinction crisis that we are facing. How we do that in Argentina is by protecting what is left. 
That's why we create big national parks like Iberat. And we restore the land mostly by reintroducing keystone species that went extinct that are crucial for the ecosystem functioning. We are working in different places in Nibera. So far there are six different places where we are reintroducing species. And then we develop economic activity for the, the local people so they can get benefits from that park that is going to be created and the wildlife that we are starting to recover. Some of the species that now are very common, those ones they could recover, but others could never recover by themselves. For us to start the project, we have to bring animals from captivity. So now we are heading to one of the quarantines that we have for the project. In this quarantine, we also have a giant anteater rescue center. Every year, several animals arrive to the center. Most of them are orphans whose mother has been killed by poachers. All the animals that come from captivity start the journey in the project in the quarantine. Ali. <laughs> Ali is an Argentinian biologist and she's the one that takes care of all these animals until they are ready to go to the field to be released. Okay. Usually when the animals arrive, they are very small. They need to be fed with special milk several times a day. Okay. When they are big enough to carry a harness with a transmitter, we can release them in the wild. The giant otter is another species that went completely extinct in Argentina because of hunting, because we destroyed their habitats through logging. It's the first time that a reintroduction project is run for giant otters. But the thing is that there are no otters in captivity in Argentina. So Coco is the first male of the project. He's still in the quarantine. He came from a zoo in Denmark. And once he finished the quarantine, we will bring them to the Ibera Park to a pre-release pen, where a female that also came from Europe is waiting for him, that's Alondra. Coco and Alondra, they don't know each other, so there's a long way for them to learn how to raise the calves. And once they are ready, we will be able to, to release them in the wild. With the macos, we have the most 
hard work for rehabilitating those animals. Because most of the macos that we bring to the project, they come from zoos or wildlife rescue centers, where they spend many years of their lives in small cages without the possibility of flying. You not only have to change their diet, but we also have to teach them how to fly. It can be up to one, two years for each individual, in which we train these animals that come from captivity to survive in the wild. All this park creation process and rewilding process cannot be done without the support of the local communities. Hola, Leiva, ¿cómo estás? Pellegrini is a small town by the Ibera Park that had an economy that was based mostly in forestry, cattle ranching, and rice fields. Now, since the creation of the provincial reserve, their main economic activity is ecotourism. Nos hemos criado con toda esta esta cultura y el local está orgulloso de poder mostrarlo. Ya que en torno al parque hay muchas historias de vidas que han cambiado. Un pueblo entero empezó un proceso de cambio encontrando respeto por su naturaleza. People become proud of what they have and now young people choose to stay in their hometown and they start to run ecotourism business as local guides. They use their knowledge and they become very proud that people come from different parts of the world to see what they know. Hoy vive en el paraje de Iberá. Hoy están orgullosos porque pueden quedarse en su lugar de origen sin salir de donde vivieron toda su vida. le permite tener un, un ingreso que le permita vivir a las familias que todavía están adentro. Thirty or forty years ago, we had the idea that the best thing that you can do to preserve a species is not touch anything. Now we say that the best thing that you can do, and sometimes the only thing that you can do, is to be very active. Dijo que andaba más o menos por el perímetro, tipo por allá. So far, we've been successful reintroducing some of the species here, like the giant anteater, the pampas deer. But we are just starting with the top predators, like the jaguar. So there's a lot of work to do here. Maga, maga, me copias. Te copio. ¿Qué onda? ¿Hay alguno por ahí cerca o estamos todo tranqui? The Jaguar Reintroduction Project is the most complicated and ambitious project that we have. We built a very big reintroduction center with very huge pens. If you go there, it looks like a Jurassic Park for Jaguars. So far, we already have five animals at this reintroduction center that we think are ready to be released. We hope that during this year, we will have the first jaguars living free in Iberá, and that will be like the coronation of the rewilding project because it has never been done before.
we have to move one of the female jaguars, Mariwa, to the biggest enclosure of the reintroduction center. It's a very big step for the project because it's almost free of our management. So it's like being already living free. Y ver todo esto hoy es más allá de la infraestructura que, que se ve, está la vista que es magnífica. Ver el avance de los proyectos emociona un poco. Sí, ¿no? El proyecto Yaguareté es algo insólito, digo, es algo único. Hay algo espiritual dando vueltas, hay una magia que está dando vueltas en torno a, a este proyecto en las comunidades. Hoy es un nada cargado de, de emoción, de alegría, de incertidumbre, de cómo, cómo nos va a ir. Entonces, feliz de, y orgulloso de este día. Rewinding is not only about bringing back the keystone species that went extinct. Rewilding is a proactive conservation action that brings joy to your soul. <laughs> When I see a group of macaws flying, what you see is all the effort that you put so that these birds can make it. It's many months of work with any individual, so it's not just two macaws flying, but also a lot of history behind those incredible colors. We don't live in cities, we live in the place where we are working. We become neighbors of the local people. They are the ones that can tell you the stories about the animals, about the places. As a team, we are really proud that we are developing a good example that we don't need to destroy nature to have a better life quality. You just feel a great satisfaction that we are fixing, as a species, most of the bad things that we did in the past. What I always think is, if we can reintroduce uh, jaguars in a place that they went extinct, what else we cannot do? I think we, <laughs> it's like we can do uh, everything. Soy Ibera Laguna, orequilla, soy paso claro, calar esa cruz a la luna, serequita de la disparo, laguna, tigre y valle, camperreta, soy estero, San Marcos y Guayaibu, soy abañe. 
soy Isla Antonio María, carambo trabajo el cielo, paguero en la javeré, ni un pesajo yo plumero, parana y misteriosa, gallosa puca ahí adentro, en mi tatu me hago río, en Fernández soy tropero. Welcome, everyone. That was a wonderful film that we just saw on this magical place, Iberá. Uh, I want to pack my bags and go right away. But in lieu of being able to do that, we do have two people who you saw in the film who are going to basically kind of take us there. Sebastian DiMartino, who you saw in the film. Since 2016, he has been in charge of coordinating the reintroduction of species that had gone extinct in Iberá. And we also mm -hmm. have Christine Tompkins. She's the former CEO of Patagonia and spent 27 years protecting and restoring Chile and Argentina's wild beauty and biodiversity. And then we also have Vanessa, the executive producer of our Impact Media Group that created this film. So let's talk about the Jaguar. I thought one of my, one of my favorite scenes in the control room where everyone is just, you know, happy to see this, this happen. God almighty, you know, it's, it brings tears to your eyes because of, you know, the backstory. And I think this happens with the release of any species and the days you think, oh, this is going so well. And then the next day something can happen and we lose a life or somebody breaks a leg. And, and so, you know, it was quite emotional for us and really we we're so excited and happy for jaguars. Yeah, yeah. As much as anything. <laughs> and I also think it represents, of course, it's an exciting in itself, but it also represents the success of this whole model and concept that <laughs> Tompkins Conservation is is doing. Yeah. So, so I think one thing that was surprising to so many people is just the method of reintroducing these animals. You can't just let them loose. Who would ever have thought that you needed to teach a macaw to fly? <laughs> So, yeah. Sebastian, can you talk about that? Yeah, it's not only teaching them how to fly, but also how to recognize predators. Because, you know, the red and green macaw went completely extinct in Argentina. It's the first time that we are attempting to bring back a species that disappeared in the, in the country. So we get the, these animals from wildlife rescue centers or zoos or people uh, who donate their pets, uh, most of them uh, didn't fly uh, in their entire life. And some of them, they even have the feathers cut. So yeah, it's kind of complicated, uh, it's hard work, but at the end it's like uh, with the jaguar uh, leaving the pen, uh, it's, uh, it's happiness, I think. So, so are these macaws breeding and raising young? Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's one of the good news uh, this year. Okay. You know that in Argentina now we are in spring, so it's the, the breeding season. This is the first time uh, that we have a macaw chicks born in the wild. So yeah, we are also incredibly happy about uh, that. We um, reintroduced uh, those individuals in 2016. So it took more than four years until they uh, have their first chicks. But yes, they are doing incredible uh, well, and it's it's also very important because it's when you start to realize that what you are doing can be self-sustainable. So there was a time when, if we thought of conservation, it was just focusing on the animals and the plants, the flora and the fauna. Mm -hmm. But the people who live in the community are just as important in the story of restoration and sustainability. Yes. and. From a storytelling perspective, especially in conservation storytelling, it, it's often framed as this story of loss uh, because of mm -hmm. humans. But in, yeah. this was just such a wonderful example of how this 
that's the the loss is not the end of the story. It's continuing, mm -hmm. and people can be just as much a part of the revival as we were of the earlier destruction. So that was that was just a a point we wanted to make with this story, and um, the Ibera story was such a great example of that. And now we'd like to welcome back our two other guests, Allison and Tuffy, are going to join us. And all of us are going to have a chat about these two wonderful films. Vanessa, thank you to you, you and your team. And if any of you are looking at the chat function, it is the most robust chat ever. The entire film team, that's uh, Impact Media team, is on the chat. Dustin, Sylvia, Ivan Agerton, Julian Cisneros and Sarah Joseph are all on answering questions. So, but the first question I want to ask you is this film was completed, these two films were completed when, Vanessa? I think the final one was released last spr spring of 2020. Okay, so we're almost a, a, a year away. So I want to hear what's been going on at each of these locations since the completion of those films. Let's, let's hear first, Allison, you and, and Tuffy, can you tell us what's been going on at APR since this film was released? Sure, Craig, thank you. Well, the filming in our location wrapped up in November with that bison handling. And we at American Prairie Reserve did an even larger bison handling of about 200 animals in January and sent 85 bison to three different tribal conservation herds across the Great Plains. So that bison conservation work and collaboration continues. Um, and then this past fall in September, the, the two tribes from Fort Belknap Indian Reservation, the Ani and the Nakoda, released swift fox back onto the landscape. 27 animals. This is a small, uh, small, very small carnivore, about five pounds the size of a house cat that has been missing from our region for uh, more than 50 years. And they worked with conservation partners, including Smithsonian's Conservation Biology Institute, to bring um, this species back, which is, of course, ecological important but culturally important as well. And how has that herd of buffalo introduced that Fort Belknap doing? Tuffy, I'll let you take that one. Okay, Allison, to the best of my knowledge, they're doing just fine. Uh, they're kind of in the central part of the reservation. And like Allison mentioned, uh, just east of the buffalo pastures where the swift fox were released this fall, and they are uh, pretty intricate part in, in both of our tribe's history, uh, folk, folklore and uh, belief. So there's a lot of growth happening with, with both of those on Fort Belmont. And, and Telfia, I understand there have been a lot of changes in your teaching. You are now, you started a new program. Uh, can you talk about the language immersion program you've started? You're starting. Oh, it, it's, it's not uh, just myself. I work for the Fort Belknap NAEDC, which is a nonprofit organization, and we've applied for an Esther Martinez grant. And what's so cool, you know, with all of the uh, animals that are reintroduced and these types of things, it, it's, it's awesome to see our languages coming, coming into the light, too, because that's such a part of, of the, the history and the vitality of all things. So we're beginning a uh, child daycare immersion program that will be uh, housed on Fort Belknap. We're kind of in the middle of COVID right now, so we're working through that, but uh, it's really an exciting time. And, and let's hear what's been happening at Ibera. Uh, Christine, do you want to start that out? Sure. Well, um, br briefly, from the perspective of having arrived to Ibera really by chance in 1997, when we had no idea um, who was missing or what was going on in that landscape. It was largely a sort of forgotten territory within the province and the country. So really in the last, since the film was made, uh, I sort of look at it from 1997 all the way to today. And it's extraordinary what the teams have done there. I think that Seba should talk about the uh, new jaguar cubs and the other species that are really flourishing. And I will mention that all of the less famous species that we started with uh, almost 12 years ago now, uh, it's springtime, so we have lots of new life 
in Ibarra and and a, a broadening community base and engagement that's really changed our the way that we look at uh, conservation entirely. <laughs> Yes, and, and as I said, uh, we are in spring now in the southern hemisphere, so we have a lot of newborns, some of them in the projects that are well established and they have already self-sustainable populations, like the colored peccary, the giant anteater, the female that you saw sleeping in the, in the film, she has her second cub right now, also the pampas deer, so that reinforces the idea that we are going in the good way, but also in the other projects that started later, or maybe they are more complex. As I said, we have the, the first wild chicks of macaws that were born in, in Argentina after more than 150 years, the species went extinct in our country. Uh, and also last week is kind of brand new. We saw for the first time in a video of a camera, of a camera trap, uh, of Mariwa, the, that, that female that you see crossing the gate at the end of the, of the film, uh, she's entering a very, very large pen. She's living out of our control. And uh, like two months ago, she had calves. We were suspicious about, about that, but we could uh, only confirm that last week. And so we are also incredibly happy because of and we have a clip of those cubs, so can we roll that clip now? <laughs> That's one of them. <laughs> they, they are incredible, I right? think. Yeah. And the, the good thing uh, is that uh, we, we don't have a control of them. It's like they are already free. Uh, we don't know the sex of them. We don't know exactly their age. So it's, it's what we, we expect from every project to start to lose uh, control so animals become more and more independent uh, until they are part of this self-sustainable population. So I think that's a nice segue to a question from one of the viewers who asked, how do you get around the problem of habituation to human contact? And you've answered that with uh, the jaguars, but how about with the macaws and the anteaters? Well, they, uh, we train them so they become more and more uh, wild. It's a long process. It takes several months, sometimes years, but finally they, they can do it. And all the animals that come from uh, captivity or rescue centers, they uh, then uh, do well in, in nature except with the jaguars that you cannot release the animals that come from captivity you can only uh, work uh, rehabilitating wild animals or uh, letting those animals that come from captivity to have calves but that are raised in very big uh, pens without human contact so that's that's the way we do with the top predator it's more complex you cannot release the, the parents that come from zoos but you can release the the calves after a, a long uh, pre period also in which you raise them without having contact with humans and with their mothers teaching them how to catch the wild animals. So I've got one question for Vanessa now. So these are two short films. They're under 15 minutes in length. Uh, clearly, given the two areas that you're talking about, uh, that we're looking at, those films could have been much longer. How did you determine what the length of these films was going to be. Well, you're right. Both of these stories are just so rich that they could have each been their own feature length film. But in this case, we really wanted to um, tell shorter films so that we can tell more stories and show rewilding efforts on a, um, that are happily, happening globally, often isolated, but show how they're related to each other. Yeah. So the 20, 20, 15 to 20 minutes allowed us to then tell a total of four four stories and make four films all about rewilding efforts okay. around the world.
Good, good, good. So let's talk about rewilding. I mean, that's the title of tonight's program, uh, Rewilding the Americas. And uh, you know, what does it take, you know, all of you to, you know, what do you need in place to make sure that rewilding is going to be a success? Let's start with you, Allison and Tuffy. Allison, you go first. Sure. Well, you need, you need good science. You need good collaboration. I think that both films highlighted that. You need community leadership and support, um, persistence, <laughs> patience. There are some rewilding efforts that have occurred in our um, in our region, including with the black-footed ferret, which have been, are decades-long efforts. And so, um, and then good collaboration globally too. We're we're learning from one another. We're we're certainly learning from the, the project that Chris and our colleagues are doing. And uh, with our bison restoration efforts, our our team spent uh, weeks studying, working with Elk Island National Park up in Alberta, Canada, and handling and learning about their handling facilities and learning about the handling um, of animals in order to make sure that that was a that was a safe uh, process for, for both animals and humans. So um, persistence and tenacity for okay. sure. And, and Tuffy, if you were advising someone who is embarking on a rewilding project, what, what would you say to them? You know, your expertise is the culture. Well, I, I, the, um, our neighbors to the north in Canada amongst uh, the native populations up there, they're referred to as First Nations people. And the Canadian government uh, started uh, a movement called Reconciliation and uh, how they are working with First Nations people to, you know, better the lives of, of the people on the reservations. It, that, that's a big process. They're starting to look at, you know, where we've come from, how we've gotten to the point we are and, and how to best help not only <clears throat> the wildlife, and, and the earth, but also its people. So I think that's, that's a really a, a valiant effort that we, we all need to be looking at. Exactly what's happening, you know, in Argentina. That, that, that's really awesome. And speaking of Argentina, let, let's hear from you, Chris and, and Sebastian. You know, what, what does it, what needs to be in place for rewilding to be successful? I think I'll go first uh, with with a broader point of view. I, I think that reconciliation, uh, Tuffy, is the word because it it rewilding, especially when you're talking about top predators. Uh, it, it takes a nation, it takes a region, it takes a local community, and and neighbors to agree with some plan that over time having everybody back where they're supposed to be benefits human communities and of course the non-human world as well and speaking of communities i'll just say that often we speak about local communities uh, when it comes to rewilding but uh, events like this evening really inspire me because we need to expand the concept of community around rewilding globally. Not only the people who are on the ground actually executing it, but that leadership around the world sees that restoration of all sorts of species, flora and fauna, will be the next economy in the next century. So. I, I, I see this as a, as a wonderful step, and then I'll turn it over to Sebastian. Yeah, maybe I would add also to have an incredible team like we do have in, in Iberá and in other places of Argentina and also in Chile. Uh, also the support of the local people, of politicians, uh, why not of donors, because <laughs> you need money to run these, these projects. And also one thing that I think is very important, you have to take risks. That sometimes uh, people are afraid of taking risks, but you have to, to move forward, you have to learn from <coughs> success, but also from failures. Uh, I think that's also key in, in reward. And we're talking about rewilding these huge, huge spaces. But Vanessa, you have a bit of advice for how 
all of us might be able to, to, to have a, a hand in rewilding. Let's talk about your personal experience besides filming these, these two spaces. Uh, well, right. I think re it's awesome when rewilding can happen on these grand scales, but I wanted to share that uh, we're rewilding our backyard. So it's really something that, that anybody can do you know, reintroducing native species and getting to know the flora and fauna in your own areas. Um, so then rewilding becomes something everybody can really participate in. So we've got a question from a viewer who asked, and I think this is a question maybe for Allison, with the price of recreation lands in the Intermountain West increasing dramatically, ranchers too, are becoming endangered in certain ways. How can we share the love of biodiversity with an increasingly urbanized country, a population that probably has never seen a bison? Allison, take it away. All right. <laughs> oh, but, um... Let me think about where to, to go with that. Um, certainly, so one thing that I know that um, Chris and her team have done with their projects, and, and we certainly have, is, is open American Prairie Reserve up to the public. We um, operate now a safari camp, two campgrounds, and three huts, and work um, closely with uh, with the local community, too, to provide services for, for those visitors who come out. So we have people coming from really around, around the country and around the globe to experience American Prairie. The, the prairie is a place that uh, you need to slow down to really, to really truly appreciate it and realize that you're this this very small part of of nature and you're a very small part of the world. So we work, um, for instance, with with the um, organization that Tuffy now works for, the Economic Development Corporation, on Fort Belknap to have an interpretive guiding program, uh, naturalist guiding program. And so once we are through COVID, we can, uh, you know, have our visitors out uh, out with um, the, well these naturalist guides. So I guess I would say that um, certainly um, we encourage people to. To, to visit places in order to truly understand them and to be motivated to be on the team protect, protecting them. So let's take out the bison as the subject and, and let Chris and Sebastian answer that question too. You know, you, you know, how do you make people understand the importance of introducing these animals into these areas? And I think one person is particularly asked about the jaguars, whether there was any uh, resistance to the introduction, introduction of the, the jaguars. Well, I'll answer the first part of that question and save us should answer the last three quarters of it. Since we started, all of the land that we acquired over the last 28 years, we donated into the National Park System of Chile and Argentina specifically so people could, first of all, feel a sense of ownership, Chileans and Argentines, for these territories, and that they could visit them, get to know them, fall in love with them. And that's a huge I think that's so important. I think that if you take lands that are not accessible, then you're missing a lot of the power of protected areas. Um, and then I'll pass the other side of that to Sebas. Yeah, jaguars, we are working with jaguars in northern Argentina, also with pumas in Patagonia. And so predators are always complicated. Uh, they went extinct in many places uh, because of the conflicts uh, with the humans. And in, in our case in Iberá, for example, at the beginning, most of the people didn't know too much about uh, jaguars, but they recognized them as a, as a problem. Or in, in the best case, as something neutral. But most people remember the stories of jaguars being a problem. And now, uh, with all the work that we made with uh, communities, storytelling, with all the individuals that we brought to the project, people is starting to see the jaguar as opportune. Jaguar means a uh, job creation now in, in Iberá, like all the other species that we reintroduce. So that's uh, the main way also with education and communication, but mostly through economy, that people start to support uh, these uh, projects. And with the local communities, what we do is we uh, 
create uh, new economies, uh, restoration economies, that when they do better, the environment does uh, better. And Diana, the, the vice mayor of that small town that appears on the film, she's a very good example of that. Maybe their great grandparents hunted the showers, and now she became a leader that is supporting the Jaguars uh, come back because she believes in a new economy and in a new way to relate with, with nature. And I guess this ties into another question from one of our viewers. So what is being t done to ensure that poaching does not become a problem in the future? <clears throat> Well, if, if people perceive the jaguars as an economic opportunity, uh, they will prefer the jaguars to be uh, alive rather than dead. Uh, in the past, the best uh, jaguar was the dead jaguar, and we now say that the best jaguar is the jaguar that is alive. And that's uh, because uh, that change of perception that I was uh, telling about. Uh, the jaguar now means opportunity for Ibera people. Like what happened in other places of the world, like in Pantanal, in Brazil, for example. So that's a, like a, the big challenge, to transform these uh, top predators into opportunities so the local communities uh, help uh, to protect them. That is what is happening in, in Ibera right now. So we've got another question from a viewer who asks, is there an order to how animals are reintroduced in terms of how it impacts the food chain and survival? Who wants to take that question? Allison? Sure, I can, I can take that one. So in North America, we follow the North American wildlife model. So states manage um, wildlife and have, um, have the authority over which states, and in some cases the federal government, have authority over which species are reintroduced to, to certain areas. And so um, the, the tribes, the sovereign nations, can lead reintroduction efforts as they have with have the swift fox. And then in the case of the bison, our bison are livestock. So they're really, I think, the, the, the three examples of, of black-footed ferrets, bison, and swift fox are a good example of um, some of the species that were that were missing from the region um, that that are now back. But certainly, scientists are looking at that interplay between between um, uh, predators and prey, and then and the impact on the ecosystem of, of these various species. So, so you said something interesting. You said the bison are considered as livestock. Yes, in the state of Montana, they have a dual status. They're, they're wildlife around, around in, in Yellowstone National Park, and then they're uh, livestock in, in the rest of the state. Oh, okay. So are the, the property of, a, of American Prairie Reserve. Okay. And, and for you. And in a large unit, um, a lar managed in a large fenced unit with wildlife friendly okay. fencing. Okay. And, and Sebastian, you know, for, for you at Ibera, you know, what, how do you decide what animal to reintroduce? Mostly we work uh, with keystone species that are missing, species that have a very uh, important ecological role, that, like top predators or big herbivores or big fruit eaters like the, the macaws. And how they, they act in the ecosystem is mostly through trophic cascades, through the food web. So once uh, these animals are uh, not there anymore, like jaguars, uh, the ecosystems start to degrade and sometimes it collapses. So uh, a, a healthy ecosystem is the ecosystem that has uh, all the species that inhabit that uh, place in historic times and also in good uh, numbers. In that way, you have a vibrant nature that is good for everyone, for the for wildlife itself, of course, for the environment and also for, for local people and their economy. So we are running out of time and we have a lot of questions, but I'm going to end with this one because it is looking to the future and it involves a young person. And so this viewer asks, what advice do you have for a sixth grader who wants to get involved in rewilding and ecobiology in general? Let's have all four of you, and I'm looking at my screen, so Chris, you go first. 
I think that I don't care how old you are, there is an opportunity for you that may start in your backyard or it's in your town or wherever you are because rewilding starts with rewilding our minds first. And that really is important. So as a very young person, it sounds like you're already on your way. And you look around, there are people in your communities who are working on restoration projects, whether it's grasslands or forests, you name it. So get out there every day and get involved and then report back <laughs> on how you do. <laughs> and, and, and Tuffy, can you uh, address that question? I mean, you know, what do you tell your students about this sort of thing? Oh, those are my favorite, those, these are my favorite conversations. Because there's an old saying, it says, uh, we do not inherit this earth from our fathers, we borrow it from our children. So uh, my advice to you is, is just like Christina, just get out there and make a difference in the world. This is, this is your place, this is our place. And we're all in it together and we depend on each other. We depend on those things that fly, those things that swim, all of it. It, we're all connected to one another. Mm. And Allison, how about you? What advice would you give this young person? Well, I have a second grader and a third grader myself, and I watch their passion, their thirst for knowledge about the animals around them and animals in far off places. And so I guess to add to, to what Chris and Tuffy said, I would say, uh, just find any opportunity you, you can to learn. National Geographic actually has some fantastic online educational resources and find those opportunities to learn and, and share, share that passion with your peers and then get involved. And Sebas. I also think everybody should get involved with rewilding. I think rewilding is the future. I think it's maybe our last uh, chance uh, because uh, traditional conservation, like protecting what is left, I think is something that we should keep doing, but it's not enough. We have to recover what we lost, and that is that is rewilding, I think. And it's not only about uh, rewilding the species, rewilding the landscape, but also rewilding people, rewilding ourselves. So clearly you and Christine are drinking from the same well rewild your mind. So that is a phrase that I think that all of you are kind of preaching to us. And those are wise words with which to end this program. I want to thank all of you, Christine, Allison, Tuffy, and Sebastian, and Vanessa also for creating this film that was the focus for us to gather here tonight to talk about rewilding the Americas. Thank you to all of you who joined us this evening and took part. And thank you to our production crew, uh, my colleagues Taylor Schulke, Daniela Thompson, Jen Armand, Shane Weckeser, Kelly Bowmaster, Justin Elliott, and Paul Worsley. So we say goodbye to you and good night, and remember to rewild your mind and make the world a better place. Good night. <laughs>